the Gospel according to Mark, which you were all asked to read in advance prior to coming. And one of the benefits for having read Mark before coming is that the benefit of repetition, as you know, repetition is the mother of learning. As you move along tomorrow into your readings in Matthew and Luke, you will see a lot of these stories repeated. Eventually, you'll see about 90% of them repeated in some way or another. And uh, then you can focus more on the things that are novel and extra as found in the other evangelistic writings. So your assignment for today was basically simple as you dealt with Mark. You were to at least list a couple of insights or questions that you might have had from the first half of Mark, which I define as chapters 1 through 8, or the last half, which is the last eight chapters from 9 onward. And then please feel free to bring them to the attention of the class, and we'll deal with those things that you may have uh, discovered. Aha, I never saw it that way before, and you'd like to share it, or perhaps something that puzzled you and you'd like to ask about it. So with that thought in mind, um, our first activity then will be to turn to Mark's Gospel. As time allows later, we would um, probably be able to pick up some beginnings like, for example, the nativity narratives, the first few chapters in Matthew and Luke, and possibly some other um, introductory kinds of things as we find in relation to the synoptic gospels. But let's then start with um, Mark's gospel. And uh, as we do that, I also have the joy of telling you that probably about three quarters of you have already signed up for an epistle choice, which is wonderful. There are some openings still left if any of you uh, would like to do that. By the way, I see one little problem. No, I don't. Everything is perfect so far. Good job. All right, so you may want to come at the end of the period to see what's still left if you want to think about it overnight, those of you who haven't had a chance to sign up just yet. So then, um, as we look at the first eight chapters of Mark, Anybody at all who would like to volunteer something, we're going to try to get most of you involved in some way or another. And please raise your hand so I can spot you. Okay, we're dealing with David here, is that right? Well, Mark seems to keep everything very brief. Yeah, yeah all, all of his little descriptions, are, he describes it in a very brief sense. And for the most part, he seems to just focus on what Jesus taught even from the beginning and, okay. and throughout the first eight chapter. That's a good point. His, his ability to summarize, to say things briefly. Actually, there are a few stories where he gets more expansive than the rest, but very few. And he also has the penchant for uh, showing Jesus on the go. If Mark were a basketball player, his favorite play would be the fast break because his key word is the word immediately. And you see the word, the Greek word, ethus, used 40 times throughout the gospel. Now, you don't necessarily pick, up, pick that up when you read your NIV because the translators have had the ingenious way of saying at once and then and now you know, instead of immediately. If you read the RSV or the ESV, which uh, our church is going to be using more increasingly, the word immediately pops out all over the place, which is the same Greek word, you see, you see, you see. And, you know, it just you know, shows Mark's sense of the immediate. He's moving Jesus on. He is a man of activity. Great things are done by him. Miracles are the key focus here. He stresses miracles, um, well, much more than anything else even more than the sayings of Jesus, the works of Jesus. He's an active man, and he, he's on the move, immediately on to something else. Thank you, David, for that insight. Question, insights by others. All right, uh, Timius. Um, if, if Mark is, is stressing the work, yet he's, he's writing to a Greek audience, yeah. why wouldn't he stress the words and the wisdom of Jesus? The wisdom of Jesus? Yeah. Why would the Greeks be interested in works? I think what he is concerned about is the suffering church. Apparently, according to Papias and other early fathers, Mark wrote um, 
at the request of the Roman Christians to bring the teaching and the preaching of Jesus uh, into you know, the, the view of the populace, record these things before Peter dies. And of course, Peter, uh, as you know, was imprisoned in Rome. He eventually was, was killed by, by Nero's persecutions, as was St. Paul. And uh, Mark incorporates a lot of uh, situations where there is suffering or persecution going on, uh, with a bit more emphasis, for example, than you had in some of the other Gospels. And so he is writing to a suffering church which needs to see the mighty Savior who can deliver. He is powerful and able to do all these things for his people. He shows a, a powerful Savior, which is one that's really needed when you're down eight runs going into the bottom of the ninth, you know, that kind of situation. You know, Jesus can deliver. He can turn things around. He is a power-working man. So I think that overrides the fact that probably the bulk of his, his readership is Gentile, but it's also Christian, and these Christians are suffering, and he needs to show a strong Savior. So he doesn't really get, you know, terribly philosophical. And what the Gentile Christians, as well as the Jewish Christians, need to know, and, and this comes out strongly in Paul's letter to the First Corinthians, Yes, you Greeks, <laughs> there is something more important than head knowledge, but the wisdom of God is Jesus and what he's done for us. And so uh, um, Mark, as other writers, uh, show the can-do Jesus. That's the big focus he likes to bring, even to a, a, a kind of a, well, group, like you say, the Gentiles are often w interested in wisdom, but there's a higher wisdom than the kind of wisdom that they're putting on the top shelf. All right, good comment. Others, already we have um, Jake. Could he have also been giving them something that they may have, like a format they may have been used to? The Greeks and the Romans were so used to these powerful deities, Zeus and Hercules and things, of, things like this, that maybe a, a weaker portrayal of Jesus would have not communicated things as well as should have been. And That's a that very, may have been an easier adjustment. It's a good observation. Um, it, what you're hitting on is the fact that the Greco-Roman world was a, um, a world where many gods were worshipped, a pantheon of gods. Uh, the more the merrier. You know, uh, if you want to add your Christian God to it, that's okay too. It's just one of about 55 others that we want to really lift up here. And the more the better. Uh, by showing Jesus as powerful, he shows him as being unique among the idea of the potent deities like Jupiter and Zeus. And, you know, um, well, Jupiter and Zeus are the same person. One's Greek, one's Roman. Uh, anyway, the powerful gods who can strike lightning into the sky and who can play tricks on humans. Jesus isn't that kind of a god. His power is of a different sort. His power is one of pity and, and, and mercy and um, helpfulness and salvation, redemption, all that. That's the power of God for salvation to those who believe. Further, okay, we have Seth. Yes, uh, Professor, you were saying about how, you know, Mark is such an active gospel and always talking about how he's always in motion, in motion, but it seems like there's a lot of uh, kind of like side notes, like, and Jesus wanted to go away to a solitary place. He didn't want to, he wanted to be like this hidden God almost, because he always tells, like, when he's pulling out the demons, he tells them to shut up. Like, he's always being kind of hidden and wanting to be away from everybody. Like, how does that work with that active concept of Mark? Okay. Um, I want to comment two ways. One is his retreat for prayer, and the other one is be quiet. Now let's talk about the prayer thing first. Um, yes, Mark does mention that, but wait till we get to Luke, where we see prayer in connection with every significant activity. Luke highlights prayer even more than Mark does, but it's a true portrait of uh, Jesus' connectedness with the Father. He was not an independent spirit moving across the earth's landscape. He was always doing the will of the Father, and prayer was one way of staying in tune. Yes, even Mark, the man who is interested in action, shows Jesus as getting his power from the one you know, who had empowered him to, to act for him in this world. And uh, your other point was about keeping quiet, right? And um, you will notice that um, 
But whenever Jesus tells people to be quiet about something, not to noise this around, it is at a time in his ministry when, quote, his hour had not yet come. We very quickly get used to the idea that the enemies are infiltrating. You know, the Jews from Jerusalem had come to spy him out. And when he does stuff on the Sabbath, like healing or other things that verge on work, and when he puts God's priorities over the priorities of the traditions of the elders, we got to get rid of this guy because he's destroying that religion which we built up. And it doesn't jive with our teaching. And so um, as it, the enemies infiltrate and he does some of his great works, uh, don't spread it, spread it to the bad guys. And why does Jesus need extra time with his apostles? Could you respect the apostolic teaching if they'd been with Jesus for two weeks? It would be a pretty easy way to say, oh, that was a fly-by-night experience. Anybody can put on a good show for two weeks. But this was over several years. And when these guys went forth after Jesus' resurrection, Book of Acts chose them as entirely different kind of people. You think they would have gotten that in a two-week seminar? <laughs> Maybe, because <laughs> God can do all things, yeah. But here, for those who came later, wow, this was several years they were with the man. And they died for, for, for that which they taught because they had seen it again and again. It wasn't a fly-by-not operation. He was the real deal. And they all say the same thing about him. And when the Holy Spirit empowers them to be bold even to the point of giving their lives, how many people give their lives for the fake? Be real. So um, in the early part of his ministry, before he announced publicly to his disciples, okay, Mark 8, verse 31, Mark 9, verse 31, Mark 10, verse 33, you have that threefold repetition. The Son of Man must go to Jerusalem where he will suffer and die and on the third day rise again. <sighs> ah, finally, the secret is out. Peter says, no way. Come on, talk sense. Jesus says, that's the plan of God all along. Now, um, in the early part of his ministry, when he healed some of the people, he said, well, don't noise this about because we don't need to cut short that ministry which you guys need. You need to see these things, what God can do. And you know, hang in for several years. Get your seminary education, not in two weeks. Sorry about that. Your two weeks hopefully will be blessed here. But you have many years ahead of you, too. Uh, so you'll get much more. And, and that's why. Now, there is one point in the gospel where this guy gets healed in Decapolis, right? And he says, go and tell everybody. And why is that? Well, Decapolis didn't have Jews. And why not? Because this is where the pig herders lived. And the good Jews wouldn't be caught dead roaming among the pigs because they were unclean. All right. So in Decapolis, you can go and tell. All right. But elsewhere, you know, we got to be practical. You guys need me around for a while. We don't want to you know, <laughs> cut short my career before you really you know, have got your experiential education. This is an in-service training that they were getting. And his hour had not yet come. Now you notice in the fourth gospel, you get that expression many times. His hour had not yet come, and they couldn't get him because it wasn't God's time yet. But when his hour had come, this is in chapter 11, after the resurrection of Lazarus, when he raised up Lazarus under the nose of the religious leaders in Jerusalem, right over the hill in Bethany. Ah, this stuff up in Galilee. Well, who's going to believe those Galileans anyway about you know, raising somebody from the dead? Daughter of Jairus, that's a joke. Nobody believes that kind of stuff. The Galileans are stupid. But here it happened in Bethany, and they couldn't deny it. We've got to kill Lazarus now, and we've got to kill this Jesus too. You know, The fat's in the fire at that particular point. His hour had come. In the same chapter, we were told as the Greeks went to see Jesus, and Philip and Andrew bring the Greeks to Jesus, he declares that his hour had come. And he talks about the resurrection, about the grain of wheat, and unless the grain of wheat dies and comes forth again, 
there can't be new life. He's talking about his death giving new life to the world, you see. And then, of course, we have the passion narrative that quickly ensues uh, also in John's Gospel. So that's why I think, uh, Seth, you have, on the one hand, kind of a secrecy motif, okay? And on the other hand, um, well, what I said before, <laughs> forgot what I said before. <laughs> I talked too much. Okay, um, more questions, comments, thoughts. I've only heard from four of you so far. I have a very smart class. You all have something to contribute. I know that. I can see it on your faces. Okay, Ambrosia. Well, I, I see what you mean about um, Jesus being presented as an active um, Christ, but also it just seems very succinct, which kind of ties into what he was saying. But the temptation of Jesus in the desert, he doesn't. What was that last comment? The temptation. The temptation of Jesus in the yeah. desert. He doesn't really say anything about it. He just says he was tempted. He was with wild animals and attended by angels. So it's um, his his. Detailing just seems very succinct and very simple most of the time. Um. Yeah. Um, in some cases, you almost feel like, so what happened? Uh, what's the temptation? I mean, after all, he took a little stroll or a few animals. and uh, But all right, so Mark sometimes has a way of compression, but it doesn't suggest that there wasn't a temptation. It does say that it was real. He was tempted by Satan. There were wild beasts around. And it was so critical that even angels came and ministered to him. Now, you are absolutely correct in suggesting that Luke and Matthew go into much more detail showing the temptation. And we begin to see, you know, he is really being tested there. Perhaps it's a little brief. But that's part of Mark's being in a hurry. It takes him, well, about to verse 2 of the gospel to get to John the Baptist. Wow, we just barely have the title announced. So we already have John the Baptist. And it takes him to about um, verse 14 um, to get to Jesus' public ministry. Verse 12, you know, he's being tested. And then, you know, he passes his time of testing. Verse 14, he's into the Galilean ministry. So, yeah, he, he really wants to get into the action, showing Jesus as a powerful one. And maybe sometimes we are blessed that we can read other Gospels that have more detail because we want more detail. Alrighty, other thoughts, questions, comments? Alrighty, please, Luke. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning of chapter six, um, this is a comment. I just I was struck by how the beginning of that chapter, I think it goes up to verse six, um, where Jesus they talk about him as a prophet without honor in his home, own hometown. And I was just struck by how you see at the end of Mark when he's rejected by his people, you know, by his own people later on, like his death and everything. I was just struck how even in chapter six, early in early in Mark, you know, Jesus is is talking about that and knows. You know, I just found that kind of interesting. Uh huh. I, I had noticed that before when I read, right. read Mark. Uh-huh. Well, um, it's of a piece with what we read in the prologue of John's Gospel, where John says, and he came his own to his own, and his own knew him not. He came back to his hometown, Nazareth, where he had grown up, and oh, we know this kid, we know his dad and mom, and we know his brothers and sisters, and he's supposed to be some big stuff. So, you know, there is kind of a, well, truth in the fact that if you want to be regarded as an expert, you better move at least 100 miles from home and stay there. <laughs> uh, you know, the home folks remember what you were when you were a kid, and they never will forget it because you're that little kid who grew up next door, and they don't remember that you're later the President of the United States so, because we knew you back when. All right, so there's a little bit of that here. Um, verse 3 of chapter 6 says, This is not the carpenter. He was a good carpenter, am I? But now he, he makes out like he's a prophet or something. And we know uh, Mary, obviously one would think that Joseph was dead at this time because he doesn't get mentioned again. But he must have been a great father. Um, and he deserves great honor as a result. But Mar Mary's mention is four brothers. And by the way, the Catholics have a little problem with this because, you know, 
Mary was forever a virgin. Uh, she never had any other children. This way we give her special honor. Well, the gospel writers don't say that. Of course, you, you can say in the defense of the Catholic theologians that a brother can mean cousin. Yeah, it's possible etymologically to do that. But why do we need to do that? Does this take away from Mary's virtue that she had other children? Isn't it a blessing from God to you know, raise up families? Didn't God command Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply? Wasn't that God's will from the beginning that you know, there be families to serve him, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? So I, I, I don't see the need to you know, separate that. I still honor the Blessed Virgin Mother because she was a virgin mother, but I see her also as being a mother of others including the four boys that are mentioned in addition to Jesus, and sisters. Now, how many sisters did he have? We don't know. But, you know, and this is off the record. Don't put it into your notes. But, you know, there were five boys that are listed here, including Jesus, right? And can we assume there were maybe five sisters as well? Who knows? I like to believe that. And this is a very selfish belief on my part because my parents had ten kids, and this makes ten and my mother's middle name was Mary, and my father's middle name was Joseph. But don't ask me what my middle name is. I'll tell you, it doesn't begin with a J. So, all right. But anyway, um, Jesus lived and grew up in a family. And we may assume, we may assume that he shouldered great responsibilities as being the firstborn son. Mary brought first, forth her firstborn son, Luke 2 tells us, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, firstborn. Now, having brothers and sisters would suggest that if Joseph dies before Jesus gets to be 30 years of age when he began his public ministry, that perhaps Jesus for many years was also the main support for the family as a carpenter, etc. And this is how they remembered here in Nazareth. Obviously, he had gone to neighboring villages Capernaum became the center where he did most of his ministry out of his headquarters in Capernaum because obviously Nazareth was not the place. There they would reject him because the prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own kith and kin. And that's the message here. They didn't respect him because he's one of our own kids. Okay. Um, of course, those who read the gospel realize that he deserves much respect, but uh, not so in Nazareth. Interestingly, and you'll discover this when you do your readings in Luke tomorrow, Luke picks up this Nazareth rejection at the very beginning of his presentation of Jesus' public ministry. Luke 4, verse 14 to 30, is amplified you know, regarding that rejection in Nazareth. And this is kind of the thematic focus in Luke, how Jesus, there in the synagogue of Nazareth, proclaims the good news to the captives, uh, sight to the blind, and healing of you know, the infirm, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, liberty to the captives. You know? And thus the scripture is fulfilled. In your hearing, you hear about it now. Guess what? There he is, Jesus. Um, he points to himself as being the fulfillment of the scripture. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and following. Luke puts that beginning of ministry. And Jesus is constantly rejected by his adversaries. And as a result of the rejection, the gospel has always moved on. And in volume 2 of Luke, the book of Acts, you get the same thing. When the apostles are rejected, when they're driven out of Jerusalem, the word of the Lord multiplied. Okay. When Paul is driven from one city, it opens up a door in another city. And he gets driven on and on. So the whole Mediterranean world basically gets to hear the good news because of this rejection by his countrymen and the acceptance by the wider world. Okay? There's an interesting motif that is uh, introduced here in Mark, but not at the very beginning because chronologically it didn't happen at the very beginning. But Luke puts it at the beginning for emphasis sake in order to highlight you know, some of the major foci of his message. Okay. Thank you for the comment. Other questions, thoughts? Yes, uh, Christopher. In Mark 5, 29, it talks about uh, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering when the woman touches the hem of Jesus' cloak. Um, and we're told in the Old Testament that when, Joseph, uh, when Moses, Moses was in the presence of God, his face would radiate beams of light. 
And I just think that uh, knowing these things, it struck me that as much contact as Mary actually had with Jesus from carrying him as a child and burying him and nursing him and cleaning him and all the things you do with babies, she must have just positively just actually glowed and just throbbed with energy. And I, I think that sometimes the Lutheran Church, uh, we being Lutheran, we were afraid of appearing too Catholic and giving Mary too much uh, honor and credit. And so I think she kind of gets a, a short shift from us. That's probably true. And um, it need not be so. Um, we honor Mary. We don't um, adore her right, don't in the point of worshiping her, her but we honor her highly as indeed the most blessed among women, as St. Elizabeth put it so correctly. And we honor St. Joseph. And you know, maybe I'm a man of limited experience, but in my travels, I have never discovered a St. Joseph Lutheran church, have you? <laughs> or a St. Mary's Lutheran church, either, for that matter. Um, St. Joseph, we have St. Peter, we have St. Paul, we have St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, St. John. Um, Maybe a few more. <laughs> Even Timothy and Titus here. Oh, Gosh. Timothy and Titus Chapel. Yeah, we don't have a St. Joseph Lutheran Church. Oh, why not? Well, maybe, like you said, maybe we're a little bit touchy on this subject, not giving too much honor to the Holy Family. You know, but, okay, enough said. You made the point. Thank you. Other thoughts from the class or questions, things that bothered you as you read. Timius, please. How are we to understand uh, 412? Um, where it says, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. I wonder that same thing. When Jesus All right, uh, to give the context to the rest of you about that question, Jesus spoke often in parables. And why did he speak in parables? So that some might understand and others might not. Okay, that's the answer given. And that bothers you, doesn't it? Okay, now keep in mind, when he spoke in parables, he was generally speaking to a mixed audience. He was often speaking to hundreds of people at the same time. And some of the people in that crowd were troublemakers, plants sent from Jerusalem and Judea to check him out to find out how we can get rid of this guy ASAP because he is destroying our neat system. Okay, so why did he speak in parables? So those who wanted to receive the message could and would, and he always explained it to his disciples if they had any questions. And those who were out to get him couldn't. They couldn't stop him from delivering his message because, first of all, it's an interesting story, and usually short parables, and they don't understand it. So, okay, interesting, but eh, boring. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so they don't stop him, okay? Now, uh, I know that this is a little bit hard to... to figure out from the way it is worded here, but um, it's a fact that um, God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, and you're hanging on to that beautiful truth, and um, he wants that we find out about him, and uh, he wants us to worship and revere him, but when people are dead set against that, he has a way of overcoming that problem. He also has a mission to his disciples to get them ready for when he's no longer with them. He has a limited period of time to prepare them about the things they need to know about the things of God, which they weren't getting in Jerusalem from the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Oh, yes, they were getting things about the law, but they were also getting things that were a little bit skewed and incorrect and inadequate and that even lead them away from God. So his mission here is to teach his disciples, to teach all those who would receive him. And, and you know, Timaeus, we get a little bit at that again. Um, and it helps us, I think, in relation to this, to look at John 1 again, where it says um, in verse 11 of the opening chapter, John 1, verse 11, he came to his own home, his own people received him not, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God, who were born of God, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So it's, it's really a twofold purpose. One is to instruct, and that's the main purpose. But secondly, it's dealing with the reality that there were those who were continually trying to disrupt the instruction. And so the parables were a beautiful vehicle by which he could teach the truth of God um, and get it done. 
okay? Um, so that even though they might hear, they didn't really hear in the sense of obeying and making a commitment, even though they might see him in action, they didn't really comprehend totally what it would do for them because on the one hand, he didn't want to know the whole, you don't expose all your action plan to the enemy, right? If you're giving signals to your pitcher in a ball game, you don't want the guy on second base to relate to the hitter what's coming next, right? <laughs> I mean, it's the same kind of a strategy here. Uh, Jesus has this way of confounding the opponents who are set to undo his program. He moves on. He gets his teaching done. Terribles, they don't understand. He gets them taught. The ones who really are willing to receive, we move on. This, uh, this kind of applies to the whole book of Mark. Uh, were Peter, James, and John like Jesus' uh, bouncers? <laughs> His inner circle? Yeah, they because were. they seem to always go. They're there for the big stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Sure, they go in when the daughter of Jairus is raised, right? They're the only three that are allowed in the room. They're on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Uh, when Jesus, uh, this glory is manifested at a critical point when Peter says, hey, don't do that, and then Peter and the two brothers, sons of Zebedee, are on that holy mount. And, and of course, in the garden, when Jesus is at prayer, he picks these three to come farther in to see him in a prayer of agony. And why? Well, the one thing you know, that in the mouth of two witnesses or three, let a word be established, there is ample witness here for these critical points that there was, you know, human presence, and they could bear witness. Peter, James, and John were among the most influential of the disciples. No question about that. Yeah, even James, who was killed by Herod Antipas in, the year, in Acts chapter 12, we have that story. Even James, uh, he's often mentioned before John, you know, one of the sons of thunder, the mother says, put him on the right hand and the left hand of your kingdom. <laughs> They're very special to you. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, there's another thing. If you take three people and give them the best of you, you know, they'll be focused because it's a small group. If you have 12 people or 40 people, um, you know, somebody's reading the New York Times in the back row or somebody is playing checkers while the prof isn't looking and he gets half of them. Get, but, you know, this is a focused witness. This is a critical point. And they're the ones who are chosen to give this and consistently chosen. They were a special inner group. Okay? Others. First part of Mark. Okay, Mr. Matthew Mao. Uh, I was reading the notes and it I found it really interesting that in Mark 728, it's the only place in the gospel that uses the word Lord. Now was that even true in the in the Greek? I'm sorry. It's the only place where what happens? Where the use of the word Lord happens because okay. it says down here in the in the notes that I was reading too mm -hmm. as I was going through that's the only place that it mentions the word or uses the word Lord in reference to Jesus interesting yeah that's probably just the best thing though it says in this gospel yeah well did I say all gospels well, I don't know I meant in in Mark it's the only time that the um, word Lord is referred to well let me see if that is the case. I am looking ahead to when Jesus is in Jerusalem. And uh, he um, has this saying from Psalm 110 in Mark 13, verse 35. In Mark 13, 35, as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David. David himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on the right hand. You see there the word Lord is used there, and it is applied to Jesus. Now, if you want me to sort of interpret what this Lord, Lord means in this, I'd be glad to give it my shot. Um, verse 36 of chapter 11, David you know, says, God, the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord, said to my Lord, namely Jesus, God the Father said to Jesus, my Lord, 
sit at my right hand. And don't we confess in the Apostles' Creed, he said, on the right hand of the Father, and you become the judge of the living and the dead, right? Sit at my right hand till I make, put your enemies under your feet. Ah, if David himself calls him Lord, namely Jesus, how is he, Jesus, David's son? Uh huh. So there, obviously, there is a reference to Jesus as Lord as well. So I don't, I didn't read your footnote, but I, I think we might add the witness of chapter 12 to that as well. Uh, perhaps I didn't. I should have read the footnote because it maybe doesn't say what I heard you say. Ambrosia. Well, it talks. It says um, it's the only place that he's addressed as Lord. So somebody else addressing him. Uh-huh. But somebody was telling me how only at the very beginning of Mark. And then at the very end when the centurion sees Christ die on the cross, those are the only two places that um, he's referred to as the Son of God in Mark. Could there be a connection between those two things? Okay. Um, Actually, Jesus is given many titles, and we don't uh, limit the use of a single way to describe him. Uh, For example, as some of you have read in your notes, that um, Mark begins with uh, reference to Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. And uh, when is he called the Christ, the Messiah? Well, of course, in Peter's great confession, at Caesarea Philippi, you are the Christ, okay? And um, so we have it probably in other places as well, but you're correct about, you know, the Son of God. You have that probably in only a few places, but a very pivotal place on the lips of the centurion at the cross Truly, this was the Son of God, he says here. You have a Gentile confessing Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, as the very Son of God. This man who probably worshipped many gods lifts him out uniquely here. So, um, yeah, uh, we should get used to the fact probably (laughs) that a lot of titles and names are given to Jesus. Actually, if you want to feast yourself on titles, go to the opening chapter of John's Gospel where you probably have about two dozen different names applied to Jesus. And that is really a feast of names. And all of them are, of course, to give honor to Jesus in terms of the various contributions and roles that he played. Okay, I don't know if that satisfied your question or concern. Any other thoughts on the first part, the first eight chapters? Thomas? Yeah, I just found it interesting, uh, and this hit, might tap into... Um, you know, Mark's explanation of action of Jesus. But I feel like Jesus continually, he, he makes an emphasis on on nourishing people in terms of actually feeding people and food. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you got the feeding of the 4,000, 5,000. Yeah. Uh, and he also eats with the tax collectors and sinners. But then there was an also a case where I think he had uh, healed a demon-possessed child. And she had gotten up and said, um, you know, and he had said, feed this child. And I just kind of found that interesting how... He continually goes back to, to that, to, to feeding people um, in a literal sense, mm-hmm. which I thought might foreshadow, you know, what was to come in him, um, you know, mm-hmm. um, dining with his disciples and mm-hmm. also us eventually. Feeding is a very important part of the gospel of Jesus. He fed their bodies, but he did more than that. And to fully appreciate the feeding miracles of uh, the... Um, synoptic gospels we have to go to John chapter 6 where that miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 is retold but now it is retold also in the context of Jesus great discourse on the bread of life and you know of course what John 6 says about the bread of life Jesus says I am the bread of life he who eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life abiding in him and you know that's a very important concept to keep in mind especially when you think about the sacrament of the Eucharist, where you know we receive the body and blood of our Lord. Why? Because we believe that through him we have eternal life. We have forgiveness and life through him. And he who sees Jesus in the context of that faith has eternal life already. And of course, we'll realize it in its totality once the Lord translates that person to glory um, in the life of the world to come. But feeding. You brought up a topic here that I have a great deal of interest in. And as you correctly mentioned, there's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. It's in chapter 6. And in chapter 8, feeding of the 4,000. I believe that's in chapter 8. 
two different feeding miracles. Yeah. You know what strikes out in my mind about those two miracles? The lesson that Jesus seeks to teach as a result of it after the two feeding miracles. And you find that in chapter 8, um, verse 14 and following. You might want to look at that for a moment. You know, after he had fed the 5,000, and they'd gathered the baskets of leftovers, and after he fed the 4,000, they'd gathered the baskets of leftovers. We, we could kind of forget the stories, right? But no, Jesus did not. Uh, the Pharisees came asking for a sign, verse 11 says, and Jesus says, oh, you're not going to get a sign except, well, um, he does give a sign, eventually, <laughs> the sign of Jonah. His resurrection should be plenty of sign, uh, you know, that he's for real. But verse 14 continues on the concept of, you know, the food thing. They had forgotten to bring bread, and they were um, in the boat, and they only had one loaf between them. That isn't very much, a biscuit or whatever. It's not one of these giant, you know, loaves uh, as we traditionally see today. And Jesus says, in light of the fact they didn't have anything to speak of to eat, he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven? Suddenly my stomach is growling. I'm hungry. <laughs> we have only one loaf in this whole boat? You know, please. And Jesus says in verse 17, why do you discuss the fact you have no bread? Don't you guys understand? I'm not talking about the bread that gives nourishment to the body. I'm talking about the other things. Now, a little quiz question here, guys. Remember, you were part and parcel of this little experience of the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 review question. How many baskets of leftovers were there when the 5,000 were fed? The answer is? Twelve. Oh, yeah. And when the 4,000 were fed, how many baskets of leftovers? Seven. Of course, now you understand, don't you? Right? You all understand what that's all about, don't you? What are leftovers for? You ever have leftovers in your fridge? Why? To eat the next day. To eat it the next day. Future feedings. Okay. Um, the bread of life. Aha. Uh -huh. The bread of life. Twelve baskets, seven baskets. Five thousand are fed. Twelve is the number of Israel, right? You think about the Jewish nation here, the twelve patriarchs. You think of the twelve apostles who were all Jewish people. The twelve baskets, future feedings for whom? Of course, for the Jews. Ooh, that's good. But what about the Gentile? Oh, the second feeding, seven baskets. What does the number seven signify? Perfection in our completeness. You know, seven and ten are sometimes used interchangeably That in, in a Jewish scheme of numbers. And, you know, when the whole panorama of nations is enumerated in the book of Genesis, how many nations? There's 70 nations, right? And when Jesus sends out, according to Luke 10, his apostles... <coughs> Um, far and wide, he sent 70 after in chapter 9 he had sent 12, you know, not only to the Jews but also to the Gentiles. So the number 7 is symbolic here of future feedings for the Gentiles. Okay, Who is to be fed with the bread of life? Jews and Gentiles. Now do you understand? What about the teaching of the Pharisees? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. What were they teaching? Ooh, you don't know this? I have a little poem here that sort of encapsulates the attitude of the Pharisees. And this is in connection with Luke 15 that I jotted this down. This is the feeling of the Pharisees. We are the choice selected few, and all the rest are damned. There's room enough in hell for you. We can't have heaven crammed. That was the feeling of the Pharisees. They were a little bit exclusive, weren't they? You know? And Jesus scores them for that attitude of exclusivity. And he broadens the outreach of God's good news also to the nations. Now do you understand the bread of life? John 6, he who eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life abiding, no matter who, Jew or Gentile, future feedings. Baskets of leftovers, important detail. 
Okay, 12, 12, 7 helps us to understand. Okay, now you've been very forthcoming. I would like to pick up a few things before we move to um, the latter portion of the gospel. Some things that I picked up that perhaps you didn't or perhaps you did but you didn't want to talk about it. Um, what about the word immediately? Hmm. Uh, I'm just going to give you a few quick jottings here. Now I have my RSV Bible in front of me where I see it all over the place in the opening chapters already. In chapter 1, verse 12, the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. And in verse 18, immediately the disciples left their nets and followed him. Verse 20, and immediately he called them. Verse 21, they went to Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue. And I could just go on and on. But you really need the RSV or the new ESV in order to capture that, or the Greek text, which is even better. But for some of you, you haven't had Greek yet. And so uh, I mentioned that. Well, I could multiply examples, but like I said, it's already from the very beginning, and there's about 40 such examples where that adverb seems to be Mark's preferred adverb. In chapter 3, we have uh, an interesting sin that's <coughs> mentioned here. And usually this sin is omitted because it is the sin of omission, okay? Uh, this is in relationship to the opening paragraph of Mark 3, where on the Sabbath day, the man with the withered hand uh, is before him, and Jesus asks the question, verse 4, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? He sees this as a clear-cut choice. Either you do good to the one who needs it, or you do harm if you don't do good, and you can do good. And, of course, his opponents weren't about to touch this man on the Sabbath because in their theological scheme, this would be sin to work on the Sabbath. You cannot cure a man on the Sabbath. That's work. You can ameliorate the condition. You can keep it from getting worse, but you have to wait till the next day if you're going to heal him. <laughs> So Jesus is very clear about that, and he's very angry, verse 5. Now, can you be angry without sinning? Didn't Jesus himself say, be angry but sin not? Here he is angry over evil, and he is angry over the effects of Satan in regard to the death of Lazarus. Satan brought death into the world. Never was God's plan. So here he is angry because of their unwillingness to do good simply because of man-made rules. Man-made rules can be very good, but sometimes they can be bad as well, and this is one such case. Okay, uh, let's rapid fast forward to chapter 5, verse 39. I have a reference here to... Sleeping. This is in the case of the daughter of Jairus, who was clearly dead. And Jesus says, she is sleeping. And they laugh at him. Don't you see the obvious? No breath, no pulse. She is dead. Well, he said the same thing about Lazarus when we get to John chapter 11. Not to worry. We can take our time. Yeah. Well, maybe we should go now to Jerusalem. He's, after all, he's sleeping. Okay, you don't have to go yet because, you know, he's sleeping. You'll get better. Oh, Jesus, look, guys, when I say sleeping, I mean he's dead. He's dead. Well, don't we still use that same terminology today when we sing, asleep in Jesus, blessed sleep? <laughs> And perhaps there is a theological point to be made out of this. Then in a way, death is like a sleep because we intend to wake up physically at least. Uh, uh, physically on the last day, our bodies will be glorified and um, we will be um, reunited with our spirit, which is always in the hands of the Lord. As long as, you know, as soon as we come into faith, we have eternal life abiding in us. John 5, verse 24, in case you want the reference. So, she is asleep. Um, she is awaiting the resurrection. All right, but Jesus brings her out of 
her physical sleep, out of her physical death, and uh, later, of course, he would die again, as was the case with Lazarus. But in the meantime, Jesus wants to give a perspective on what human death really is. It's a temporary state of the loss of vital functions of the human body, but it doesn't mean it's the end of the human body because the human body will be raised and it will be raised gloriously without imperfection as 1 Corinthians 15 would have a C in greater detail. Okay, I think we probably should rapidly move on. Let me go to the very last verse of chapter 8 which connects with the first verse of chapter 9 and this kind of opens the gate for you to bring up concerns about the last half of Mark's gospel which we really haven't touched to this point. But you'll notice in Mark 8, verse 38, um, this is right after Jesus <clears throat> had announced his, his need to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die and rise again. That's the first time he made this announcement after you know uh, Peter recognized him as the Christ. And then this is how I will do my Messiah work, do it in Jerusalem as God had foreordained and planned. And... Um, <clears throat> Then, at the conclusion of the sayings of Jesus in this chapter, verse 38 continues, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation of him will be the Son of Man ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father and with the holy angels. Well, obviously and clearly this refers to the second coming of our Lord, doesn't that? Um, God will bless those who stand up for him, those who run away from him, in their life and are ashamed of him when he comes again unfortunately <laughs> they're going to be the ones who are going to really be ashamed um, in serious ways however please note an important verse in chapter 9 that follows and I bring it up because when you read Matthew's parallel account and Luke's parallel account they're not as clear as Mark is here because in Matthew, for example, and you read this tomorrow when you get to chapter 16, um, you don't have a reference to his return with power as you have in 9 verse 1. Uh, Jesus does say in Matthew that um, there are some who are still alive who will see the coming of the kingdom. Mark is more explicit. He's not talking now about the second coming he's talking about something that happens in their lifetime Julia I say to you verse 1 says of chapter 9 some standing here who will not taste of death before they see the kingdom of God come here are the key words with power power how would the kingdom of God come with power now as we look at the concept of the kingdom of God in the New Testament we will see that the kingdom of God comes in a variety of ways Jesus could say, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you by virtue of his presence among them. You know, God is king over your lives because I am your king. Jesus could say to his disciples, the kingdom was present in his presence with his followers. He could also say that he would come in glory and his kingdom would be completely um, obvious and total at this point as all sin will be removed from the landscape and the blessed would be forever blessed in his presence. But there are also other stages. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, we pray that God's kingdom come. Well, Jesus said his kingdom had already come. And he said it will come. But what we pray for in the Lord's Prayer is that his kingdom be among us, that we be his loyal subjects and followers. <laughs> We're praying for ourselves for inclusion. Let it come to me also. But when he speaks about his kingdom coming with power, what's he talking about here? It is my belief, and there are different opinions on this. Some people think, well, maybe uh, this is a reference to his conquest of uh, the Roman conquest of Jerusalem. You know, when, when you know, with great power, the uh, city of Jerusalem was was destroyed, as Jesus had predicted. But I think I think it's when you look at Luke's gospel and the book of Acts too. Uh, it, it probably has to do with what Luke says at the very end of chapter 24 when he says to his disciples after he, you know, rose and as he was about to ascend, he said, stay in Jerusalem till you receive power from on high. God's kingdom will come to you with power. 
and then go. Same thing is mentioned at the beginning of Acts, where he is about to leave them. This is Acts 1, verse 6 to 8. And he says to them to remain in Jerusalem until they receive power from on high. And then you will be my witnesses in <coughs> Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But don't go till you get power from on high. And you know what happens at Pentecost, the very next chapter, Acts chapter 2. They got that power. And these formerly frady cats suddenly became indomitable witnesses, even to the point of taking happily imprisonments and beatings, and in the case of most of them, suffering death by persecution, persecution leading to death. Uh, John, the, one of the 12, did not die a martyr's death, but he lived a martyr's life <laughs> as he suffered a lot in exile. There's even one legend, it's extra biblical, that he at one time was transported to Rome where he was boiled in oil. I don't know how much credence we want to give to that, but we do know about his exile in Patmos, according to the book of Revelation. So I, I bring this up because this is one case where Mark's gospel clarifies what for many people in the other uh, synoptics is a very difficult passage and they can't explain it. And some of them even say, some very learned people, oh, well, Jesus made a mistake here. He thought that he would come again during the next generation, but obviously he was wrong. Well, Mark clarifies this picture for us as he shows us that the kingdom is a multifaceted thing. It came in the presence of Jesus as he was incarnated. It comes as he comes to us personally, and we declare him to be our king and ruler of our life. It comes when he gives power to enable the disciples to be what they couldn't be on their own power through the power of the Spirit. And believe it or not, some of you in a few years, probably most of you, maybe all of you, will have somebody lay hands on you and bless you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And you'll do things that when you were a teenager you didn't think you could do because the Spirit of God gives you the courage to do that because he indwells you. Okay, we're ready to go on to verse to chapters 9 to 16. And here I see one hand right away, Ambrosia. I just have a quick question. Is, this is John Mark writing this, right? John, John Mark. Mark. Yeah. Is that the same John as James and John Mark? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask that question because I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure which John this is. Uh, this, I'm sorry, now, the, the gospel writer is John Mark. That's, that's your point. Uh, this is not the same as John, the brother of James. It is the same Mark who goes with Paul on his first missionary journey. It's the same Mark whose mother Mary lived in Jerusalem where the disciples often gathered together. <sighs> According to Acts 12, you know, when Peter escaped, he went to the home of Mary and Mark, that family. So John Mark is different from John, uh, who is the evangelist. But Mark's an evangelist, too. <laughs> and this Mark is first mentioned in Acts. He's first mentioned in Acts. Yes. You're right. However, however, <laughs> I know you're leading to this. Chapter 14, verse 51, right? You were thinking of that, weren't you? Uh, well, maybe you weren't. <laughs> but he's not mentioned by name there. But most interpreters believe that when Mark 14, verse 51 says... A young man followed. He had nothing but linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, and he left the linen cloth, and he ran away naked into the night. And this could be the first New Testament streaker. Um, and it likely was the evangelist. And, you know, why should he mention that? Certainly he wouldn't mention his own name in connection with that. But why mention it at all? Um, Archibald Hunter, in his beautiful little commentary, says it's like... A news reporter is reporting on a great train wreck. And there were people screaming, and blood was gushing out of their bodies from all over. And suddenly, Mary Jones dropped a handkerchief. You know, a little detail like that. <laughs> I mean, how does that fit in? <laughs> OK. Uh, unless it were Mark's own personal experience. I was there. I am a witness to Jesus being seized in the garden. 
and I have a right to tell about it. Besides, I was with Peter, too, as some of the church fathers said, so he, he was a reliable witness. But that may his, be his own little personal signature, where to his shame he admits that he ran away scared. And the word that is used to describe this young man in the Greek, are you ready? Neoniskos, which occurs only one other time in the whole Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, who at the empty tomb is there to announce that he is risen? A neoniskos, a young man, or as some of the other evangelists say, an angel announced the fact of Jesus' resurrection. You see the polarities here between the young man who runs away and the young man at the tomb who declares the victory. So you have the fear of death on the one hand and the joy of victory on the other hand. Now, don't tell me Greek isn't fun. Okay, so two times in the whole gospel where that word is used, and they're at polarity points. Okay. Other points from Mark 9 to 16. Okay, we have a set. Uh, number six on the study guide, uh, the differences between the Jerusalem and the end of the world. Well, what, is, what does Mark mean by the little apocalypse thing? Okay. Your study guide. The little apocalypse is a term generally given to refer to chapter 13 of Mark's gospel. In other words, when we use the term apocalypse, we usually think of the whole big book of Revelation, right? But Mark also, in a very brief statement, one little chapter gives us his version of the second coming. And that's why they call it the little apocalypse. Now, uh, I have found it on my study guide, but in the process of finding it, I forgot the rest of your question. What was well, I was it? just wondering, what's the different one? Can you flush number six out there on the study guide? And OK. Like, what's the, what does he mean by the difference between the Jerusalem and the end of the world? Oh, OK. Good question. Let's turn to Mark 13 at this point and deal with that. That's a very important question. And because it, it not only deals with Mark's gospel, but also the way in which Matthew and Luke tell us about the end of the world. They do the same thing. They move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. From the end of Jerusalem, end of the world, end of Jerusalem, end of the world, end of Jerusalem, end of the world. And what's the point of it? Who would ever believe such a teaching that the world would go up in smoke one day. Nobody, of course, in their right mind could believe that except Al Gore. Uh, sorry, <laughs> didn't mean to get political here. <laughs> um, well, if you would believe that somebody says, within 40 years, Jerusalem will be down the tubes. Oh, come on, give me a break. Not again, this is the city of God. Well, it happened exactly within 40 years. In the year 70, the Romans left not one stone upon another, as Jesus said. They wanted to be, this to be an object lesson in the temple area. It was totally obliterated and destroyed. You can't believe that? Well, after 40 years, you do believe it, because it did happen, just like he said. Who is then to doubt when he speaks about the end of the world? You see, the interweaving here is to strengthen the argument also about, you know, belief that he will truly come again one day to deliver the righteous and to uh, bring to an end the existence of all that is evil. So to, to get to, to your question, how, how does the intertwining take place? If you wish to do this in your margins, you will see that in chapter 13, the opening verses talk about the wonderful buildings. And Jesus saying up to verse 2, not one stone will be left upon another. It's clearly about the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, no doubt about it, right? They're talking about the temple area. But then, now as they're sitting on the other side of the Kidron Valley on the Mount of Olives, uh, Jesus is telling them to not be led astray by people who think that, uh, well, with the end of Jerusalem, that's probably the end of the world too then, right? No, there's, there's another destruction coming later. Don't let people lead you astray. This is just the beginning of sufferings, verse 8 says. And you're going to be suffering for my name's sake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and... Uh, you know, they'll deliver you to trial and so forth, verse 11 says. 
but he who endures to the end, the same will be saved. That's the end of the talk about the end of the world. It's not going to happen just yet. Jerusalem, yes, within one generation. But in verse 7 it says the end is not yet. There's a different end in mind. We're talking about two different ends, Jerusalem and the end of the world. So back to verse 14. We're now back again to Jerusalem. Uh, when you see the desolating sacrilege, usually the desolating sacrilege has something to do with messing up the temple, whether it's a defilement as in the time of the Maccabees with bringing pig blood onto the altar or some other way of desecrating it as the Romans threatened to do, which led the people in Jerusalem later to revolt. Okay, when you see the desolating sacrifice, okay, this would uh, ultimately, you know, talk about how Jerusalem would be destroyed. He, he gives some advice here. He says, for example, in verse 17, the women who um, are with child or who are nursing their babies, uh, it will be bad for them because it will be doubly hard for them to get away because you do have to get away when the Romans are sieging. And uh, you have to take care of an infant. In addition, is, is doubly difficult. Flee, get out of Jerusalem when the Romans come. Um, well, um, that's uh, talking uh, through to about verse 23 about Jerusalem. But now verse 24 talks about the far demonstrative. How many of you have had Greek? You've had the joys of uh, Dr. Veltz or at least his textbook, right? And uh, you know that the near demonstrative these and the far demonstrative those, the far away, okay? And it says here in those days, the far away days, okay? Now we're talking about the end of the world when it speaks about sun and the moon be dark and et cetera, et cetera. And the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. This is the second coming, clearly. The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, right? Okay, he will gather the elect. This is all what happens when Jesus returns at the end. But now we shift again, verse 28, to the fig tree. Ah, the fig tree. The fig tree, the vineyard trees in the Old Testament oftentimes are symbolically used to depict what happens to Israel. Okay, learn the lesson from the fig tree. Um, about its branches, about its leaves. Uh, when you see these things, uh, know that he is near at the very gates. Who would be at the gates of Jerusalem very soon? Truly, I say, verse 30 says, this generation, the near demonstrative, this generation will not pass away till all these things have taken place. Jerusalem would fall within a generation, and it did within 40 years, one generation, a biblical generation, okay? But now verse 32, notice we shift again to a far demonstrative. But of that day, referring now to the end of the age, and this is how the little apocalypse concludes with a reference to the final coming of Jesus. Of that day and that hour knows no man. While Jesus could depict with clarity the generation in which Jerusalem would be destroyed, he does not depict clearly when the second coming would happen. And so the point here is to be watchful. To be watchful... In the night, whenever evil would attack, <laughs> which watch? The first, second, third, or fourth watch? All watches. All watches of the night. Um, in the evening, from 6 to 9 p.m., be watchful. Um, at midnight, up to 12. At cock crow, 3 o'clock, the roosters start crowing to signal the new day is coming in the oriental world, in the, sorry, in the, um, subtropical regions. And by the way, I have experience living in, in the subtropical world for one month, and it really is true that the roosters do crow at 3 o'clock in the morning to wake you up. <laughs> okay. Or um, in the morning, the graveyard shift, as we say, at 3. So all night long, be watchful and prepared, for you do not know when he will come. Okay. Thank you for that question. I talk too much. Other questions? Yes. I didn't really have a question. It's more just about common. Um, Jesus' ministry began with his baptism and like the tearing open of the sky. And then it, his ministry ended with his death and the tearing of the, the temple the curtain. curtain. Yeah, and I just good. found that interesting that Very good. it began with the tearing and ended with the tearing. Yeah, yeah. Did you all hear that? The Greek verb schizo, right? The tearing open, creating a schism. The sky tears apart at his baptism and it's Spirit descends in the form of a dove. This is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. 
And then at his crucifixion, the temple curtain is torn, which indicates that we have direct access now to the Holy of Holies. We don't have to wait for the Day of Atonement for the high priest to come in in our behalf. We can directly come to approach the throne of grace and receive forgiveness in our time of need. Schizo, good verb. Baptism, death, and resurrection. Other questions or points that any of you like to make before I pull in some points of my own? You know, you're getting to the part of the gospel that you probably know better because of this part, you know, the other evangelists are kicking in a lot more. And so the first part probably generated more questions. Besides, this was an early part of the day when we weren't all tired yet, right? Uh, let me pick up a few things on my own here. Uh, chapter 10, verse 43, if you will, please. Here the idea of greatness is defined. Now let me ask you, who is the greatest person in your life? Is it Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, or your mother? Or your dad? <laughs> your parents, why? Why? They did the most for you. They did for you. They were servants for you. And this is how Jesus defines servanthood and greatness. Um, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be slave of all. And that's the paradigm by which he would live. And this, by the way, you can write it down in your books. 10 verse 45 is the theme of the Gospel of Mark. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Isn't that great? He came not to be served, like the Sadducees. We control the temple. We're going to eat the best food because you guys better beef up the offerings a little bit. I mean, I don't care if you guys don't get any meat, but the priests got it because they got to live well. They're God's agents to you, right? <laughs> All right, Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve to give his life a ransom for many. And that's what the whole business about chapter 831, 931, 1033, the threefold repetition, I must go to Jerusalem to suffer and die and rise again on the third day. That was his way of being servant to God's plan. How can you deny a love like that that gives Totally. It's pretty hard to put down that kind of a God if you really get to know that kind of a God. And that's pretty powerful stuff. And that's what this is about. Now, the very next story that follows is at Jericho. And uh, Bartimaeus is introduced here. And his name is dirt after all he is a blind beggar but he's got a name that isn't exactly flattering bar meaning sav timaus meaning filth he is the son of filth the son of dirt well, i can imagine if you're sitting on the roadside begging and has that as your main occupation you probably get pretty dusty by all the tourists passing by and maybe throwing you a penny or not, or giving you a kick in the shin or whatever, or mocking you because you're always there begging. I don't know, but obviously he wasn't top notch in the social order of, of the Jericho uh, uh, register of who's who. Um, he is a blind beggar, and he is the one who comes up with one of the greatest confessions in this whole book. When Jesus comes passing by, he refers to him as son of David. This is the first time in the book that Jesus is referred to as son of David. Now, in Matthew's gospel, you have it in the first verse. He's the son of David, he's the son of Abraham, and Matthew makes a big to-do about it. You have it in Mark too, but the irony is, it's on the lips of a blind beggar whose name is the son of filth. He the most lowly of the lowly recognizes the Messiah for who he is, the fulfillment of the promises to David. Son of David, have mercy. And you know what happens. They 
all say to him, you blooming idiot, shut your mouth. What are you doing? You're getting us in trouble. You are seeing that a new king is arising. All the Romans are not going to like to hear that story. Be quiet. But he cries all the more, son of David, have mercy. That's quite a fascinating story. And then he throws off his mantle when Jesus calls for him. And he runs to Jesus. Quite different from 1451, where the young man in the garden lets him have his mantle and runs away. <laughs> this one runs to Jesus because he sees him as the one who could give him sight. And he gives him sight. He's made well. And the chapter concludes by saying, after he received his sight, he followed him. Where? On the way. Where is Jesus going at this point? Jerusalem. To do what? To die. <laughs> Good guy. Goes with Jesus. Who would have thought that he would be such an exemplar of the faith? He followed him on the way. Now, it doesn't, Mark doesn't say he got to Jerusalem, but at least he does say that he followed Jesus. All right. Let's go on. Um, chapter 11, verse 27, to chapter 12, verse 34. Mark 11, 27 and following. What's happening here? In these next paragraphs, you have Jesus taking on the opposition, facing up to the foes, one after the other. Now his hour had come. The bridges are burnt. All the opponent groups of significance come to him. Actually, the only party group, <laughs> interestingly, that doesn't come to him are the um, Essenes. They're not mentioned as coming to him. Now, interesting. But the Pharisees come, the Sadducees come, the Herodians come, the scribes come. Why don't the Essenes come? Well, maybe they're just withdrawn from society anyway. And Jesus had one thing in common with the Essenes. And that is his outrage over what happened at the temple. That's why the Essenes separated. They couldn't tolerate the perversion of life and faith and religion at the temple. Well, that aside... The main groups come to him, testing him. The first one that comes to him, very upset, asking a very important question. Um, why? Why did this happen? Um, that um, you cleanse the temple. By what authority did you do this? By what authority? Now, Jesus knew by what authority. He could have told them right away. He said, all right, all's fair in love and war. Yeah? You ask me a question, I'll ask you a question. By what authority did John the Baptist do his work? Was it from heaven or was it from men? You answer that question, then I'll answer your question. And they conferred, and as you know, they came back. And they realized, no matter how they answered it, they'd be in trouble. And what did they do? They lied. They said, we don't know. <laughs> they had no opinion, but they couldn't give it. They didn't have the guts to give it. And Jesus tells the truth. You won't tell me, I won't tell you. Ah, <laughs> we didn't expect that. The Pharisees and the Herodians hooked up to trap him. Um... Well, I'm sorry, I, I'm jumping the gun. Th this is not the group that came to him. It's the chief priests and the scribes. Forgive me for that error. Uh, scrub it from the record. It's the chief priests and the scribes who ask this question. But the Pharisees are next. And we're going to have to skip over a parable to get to the Pharisees. This is in the next chapter, chapter 12, verse 13, where the, Herod the Pharisees and Herodians come and they ask the tribute question. You know, you pay tribute to Caesar or not? Is it lawful? Well, how could Jesus answer that question? He would obviously alienate somebody by answering that question, wouldn't he? That's at least the way they figured it. 
and maybe they could trap him and find grounds for crucifixion or death or something. And he perceived what they were up to, and he says, show me your coin. Now, who do you suppose produced that coin? The Pharisees or the Herodians? Obviously, it would have to be the Herodians, right? Because the Pharisees wouldn't want to touch such a coin because it had the image of Caesar on it. And the image of Caesar would suggest that they should worship Caesar. They couldn't do that. Show me your coin. Okay. Rendered to Caesar was owed to Caesar. Rendered to God was owed to God. How can you argue with that? Two groups that are at loggerheads with each other normally, except here they are together in wanting to trap Jesus. And he drives them apart with his answer, and they can't hook him. It reminds us a little bit of the technique St. Paul used when he was on trial in Jerusalem. And if my memory is correct, this is in Acts 23, where he appears before the Sanhedrin, and he divides the Sanhedrin, you know, on the basis of his teaching on the resurrection, which the Pharisees accept and the Sadducees don't. And the Pharisees, oh, he must be a pretty good guy after all. And the Sadducees totally disagree, and they're fighting each other. You know. So divide and conquer. <laughs> uh, very clever answer. Then come the Sadducees, verse 18, the group that doesn't believe in the resurrection. And aha, we're going to have fun with this one. Uh, in the resurrection, which you believe in, you know, this guy who had seven, the, the woman who had seven different husbands, Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Jesus says, you guys, you're all messed up theologically. Heaven will be different from the way you perceive it. You'll be like the angels. So what can they say? All right, so we could go on and on. We've touched on some of this already before, so I will not be repetitious. Uh, let me move on to um, something we haven't touched on in chapter 14. Verse 51. Sorry, I covered that one. Let's try 15, verse 21. 15, verse 21, where we have a mention of a passerby. This is after Jesus was condemned to be crucified. And on the way, um, as he, having suffered greatly already, fell down under the burden of the cross, and they commandeered Simon of Cyrene to carry that cross, and he did. He's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Little detail, Alexander and Rufus, but some people have discovered that, hmm, very interesting, Alex, uh, this Simon of Cyrene. Well, tradition tells us that Simon of Cyrene became a Christian and a leader of the church in North Africa, eventually. He came from Cyrene, a um, North African um, city, and uh, he became a leader of the church there. And uh, his son Rufus may in fact be, we don't know for sure, but may in fact be the Rufus that Paul writes about when he tells the Romans in chapter 16, verse 1, as he gives greetings to all and sundry in Rome, um, greet Rufus, greet Rufus. Could well be that this is the son of the one who bore the cross of Jesus and followed after him. And thus, he became the exemplar of a true disciple. A true disciple is one who takes up the cross and follows after Jesus. Okay? Uh, moving on, then, uh, we come to the fact that uh, the gospel comes to a very, very surprisingly quick ending. Mark 16, you have eight verses which are generally recognized to be truly from Mark's gospel. There are several longer endings. One or the other may have been an original ending. Most scholars believe probably not. There may have been a different ending that's not been found that simply broke off at the end of the manuscript that uh, is seen to be the one that at least gives us through 18 as being authentic gospel. But everything that follows in the sections that are later enclosed in brackets uh, also is true to other New Testament revelation.
But whether it's a part of this particular chapter is probably not the case. Uh, but it's, it's all true anyway, and you see it repeated in parts of Luke and, and Matthew and Acts and even some in John. Um, so we know that at least eight verses are you know, on the resurrection, which makes it the shortest resurrection account of the four Gospels. And yet, um, in a short paragraph, you can tell a powerful story, and there is no doubt the message of the young man at the tomb carried the day, and the message, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, he is risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him, tell us disciples. Well, we have plenty other amplification in the other Gospels showing the post-resurrection of appearances of Jesus in greater numbers that uh, Mark also has it, but very tersely, at, at least as far as we know. There may be more, but we don't know what more exactly. Um, but what we do have in verse 8 is they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's the realistic first thought that came to those who um, heard about the empty tomb. Now what? These people were in shock at this terrible thing that had happened. Their Lord had been crucified and he had died. He was buried and now his body is gone, and they were afraid. What now? What now? Well, Mark himself was afraid in the garden when he ran away without his, or whoever the young man is, without his garment of necessity. Um, do you think that the Christians in Rome were afraid when Nero was uh, persecuting them and killing even their apostolic leaders? But you know, even despite the persecutions and the sufferings, the gospel triumphed. And Mark brings out that story realistically. He does talk about the fact of Jesus' conquest of death. And very likely there was a longer ending that we just don't have. What we do have in the brackets of some <laughs> manuscriptal endings which are not well attested, nevertheless, also is truth. Um, so it's a very interesting gospel. Anything else before we put Mark away? We'll pick it up again when we pick up Matthew and Luke.